Hey, everybody. Welcome to our latest episode of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. I'm here today with my special guest co-host, Candace Mathis from Two Alpha Gals. And we have a really special guest today, Nick Perfumo, who's going to share his journey not only with Alpha Gal syndrome, but Lyme disease and his battle with mast cell activation syndrome as well, and how he's working to overcome all of these things and regain health. So I'm going to hand it over to Candace to say hello and kick off this podcast interview. Hi, everybody. And thank you, Nick, for being with us here today and being willing to share your story. So can we take it all the way back to your childhood? Can you share with us what your life was like as a child before, you know, you got your diagnosis of these various tick-borne diseases and mast cell? Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, it, going back to my childhood, I grew up in uh, central Florida in a small town, uh, DeBerry, Florida. And uh, I had a pretty fun childhood, uh, always playing in the woods, playing outside. Uh, we had a lot of uh, retention ponds in our neighborhood. Uh, so, you know, me and the neighborhood kids would uh, love going through there and, uh, you know, playing all sorts in this overgrown retention ponds throughout the uh, neighborhood. We'd all meet up at friends' houses and uh, to go to the different retention ponds where we cut trails and uh, just had fun boy things uh, to do, throwing pine cones at each other and things like that. So as you can imagine, there were uh, a few tick bites. I don't really recall too many um, as a young kid, but um, it definitely had a couple here and there. And um, yeah, that's, that was pretty much how my childhood was in Central Florida. So you mentioned tick bites as a kid. And I know one of the questions that we were asked by Matt and Rich was if we remembered having any tick bite prevention in schools or any education from our parents. I did not. And I wonder, did you have any of that growing up, being that you were outdoors a lot? Well, not at all. Uh, we didn't have any... Uh prevention in school or in the family. Uh, my family's from Florida and um, yeah, there's ticks obviously here, but we, I guess we never really had any of that tick prevention training or uh, knowledge growing up. Okay. So then, you know, if you receive these bites as a kid, did you, were you sick at all during that time? Do you remember? I was, uh, so I always had uh, what was at the time, just bad allergies, um, constant sinus infections, constant strep throat, um, pretty much two or three times a year until uh, my later in my life, in my 20s, uh, which listening to um, Tick Boot Camp, it seems to be a common occurrence, a uh, reoccurring thing between you know, people getting bit by ticks at a young age and they kind of just become sickly. And that's definitely uh, how I uh, feel looking back. I uh, wish yeah, I would have known what, you know, you guys are preaching this whole time, but yeah. I know it's hard when you're younger and you just, you don't have, you know, that education base, I guess, around tick-borne diseases. It just wasn't, it wasn't what it is, you know, now back in the eighties, like I don't remember any of that either. So you mentioned that things started to kind of pick up um, as far as symptoms go in, t in your 20s. Can you kind of give us more of a picture of what that looked like for you at that time? Yeah, um, to kind of go back a little further, I've uh, in my youth, young childhood, I always had a kind of an intolerance to beat. Uh, that was the one thing that kind of been stuck out. Uh, I always got GI upset uh, with beef, eating beef tacos, hamburgers, all that stuff. I mean, I never went out of my way to avoid it but I definitely had some GI upset uh, uh, from that. And then later in my 20s, um, uh, especially around when my, my wife and I first got married, it was uh, it started to develop what now is, you know, MCAS, uh, MCAS issues. And I had a spontaneous reaction to perfumes. So, you know, my wife was wearing the same perfume and then all of a sudden three, three months, four months later, I was going in a flack and my throat was closing up and every time she got in the car, I'd have to like pull over off the side of the road just to catch my breath. Um, and yeah, that was a really odd thing. And then a spontaneous reaction to wool right around the same time. So I'd wear like a wool jacket or uh, anything touching my skin. I just start itching uncontrollably. Uh, so it was definitely, 
you know, looking back, so that must have been alpha gal as far as the wool allergy um, and possibly the MCAS along with that. And also I had a lot more GI upset. Um, and I narrowed it down to red meat and we pretty much kept cut out red meat um, out of our diet. But um, the things that would really, I guess, confuse me about symptoms was uh, just fried food. I would take one bite of fried food and all of a sudden I'd be like, oh, this is the oil that I cannot tolerate uh, because it was just not knowing at first. Uh, it would just lock up my stomach. I didn't take anything in. No, I couldn't even drink water. Like it was, uh, it, it would get pretty bad with some uh, GI upset from there. Wow. So have your, okay. So we're going to talk about alpha gal for a minute. Cause right. now I'm completely curious as a kid, were you a teenager, I guess, at that time when you started having that beef intolerance? Oh, even younger than that. So I, I was probably uh, around eight to 10 years old when I started having that beef intolerance, uh, at least noticing uh, that it was beef related. Uh, okay. somewhere around that uh, young age. So we know the varying degrees of, of symptoms and reactivity with alpha gal, even among Debbie and I, our, our symptoms can be very different. Has the GI part of that, has it changed in any way over the years? Has it, how, do you have other symptoms along with that? Or do you just experience more of the GI variant of alpha gal? Um, so I, I would say I mainly had the GI variant for gal up until, I guess, more recently. Uh, around 2020, 2021 time frame, I started going anaphylactic. It was the first, uh, my first anaphylactic event, uh, which was uh, really um, scary. And I would get um, itchiness, hives all around my throat area, uh, basically on my body, um, and uh, just get extremely itchy on my legs, hands, just everywhere. Um, but that didn't start to occur until uh, later in my uh, later in my life, uh, in my mid thirties. Nick, I want to ask a question because it's really hard, I think, for Lyme patients to decipher what might just be food intolerances due to Lyme disease versus alpha gal syndrome. Because when I first got sick with Lyme disease, I had a ton of food intolerances that I never had before in my life but I never tested positive for alpha gal and I never had issues with red meat or wool or things like that. But I also did have some MCAS, you know, mast cell activation syndrome, inflammation problems that were associated to Lyme. So it's hard for me is there's so much overlap, but alpha gal is, you know, really a thing on its own as well. So how would you describe the symptoms you were having and sort of make it stand out separate and distinct from potential Lyme food and food sensitivities? Because I always have a hard time identifying like, could this be alpha gal or could this just be something from Lyme disease and not alpha gal? Do you know what I mean? I think that uh, really poses the uh, uh, a great question. And I wish, you know, there were more clear answers. I think both with Lyme and alpha gal, I wish we had more clear answers because there isn't. Um, and you had to distinguish, you know, alpha gal or this. I mean, I think that's the hardest thing about alpha gal and, you know, Lyme disease at food intolerance is we don't really know what caused our reaction. Um, and especially with the delay onset uh, from alpha gal, it, it's so hard to pinpoint, you know, you know, what's actually causing it. What is my trigger uh, this time? Uh, yeah, of course we know that it's, you know, mammal derived ingredients, but we don't exactly know what it was that caused the issue. Um, I mean, there's so much hidden byproducts and things in, um, foods that we just, it's just so hard to pinpoint. Yeah. I just wonder though, right? Because you mentioned that a, at a young age, you had the red meat allergy and it was more minor, meaning it was just inconvenient, but then it became really bad and debilitating in your twenties. But, you know, I'm going to kind of, I know from chatting with you offline that, you know, you met your now wife when you were in high school and you got married and you were doing a ton of hiking in your early twenties and you got bit by ticks all the time when you were hiking. So I wonder do you think you were bit and infected with alpha gal at a young age and you had more minimal responses to red meat and do you think you got reinfected again? Or, you know, do you believe that you just became more sensitive over time to the alpha gal allergy that you picked up at a younger age, right? It's, it's, it's really an interesting question. I'm curious what your doctors think on that as well. Um, my doctors are kind of the same, same uh, I guess, uh, perception as I do. I mean, I feel like I... I 
so I, I hy hypothesize, especially since my family, my three cousins also have a chronic Lyme disease. Um, and I believe that I probably contracted it similar time as they did um, on my grandfather's property when we were growing up. Um, and I, I kind of wonder whether it was alpha gal during that period of time, or was that like what you're kind of um, uh, suggesting that it was more Lyme based uh, food and sen uh, food sensitivities or intolerances at that time. And then as I got you know, bit by more and more and more ticks uh, in uh, the Tallahassee area. Um, I, I believe I did contract alpha gal during that uh, 2010 time frame, and with more tick bites and more tick bites, it just kept getting worse and worse as far as uh, the alpha gal uh, went. And I think they were kind of playing hand in hand uh, together on on uh, wreaking havoc on my system. So I want to I want to circle back to something that Matt, you were just talking about, because I think it's important maybe to mention that, you know, because there is such confusion, I think a lot of times, is it, is it Lyme? Is it a food intolerance? Is it mast cell? Is it al alpha gal? I think it's so important just for our listeners out there. You know, if you're struggling with any of this, just get the alpha gal test. You know, I think it's so helpful to just get that blood test to rule it out. And then you know what you're dealing with, you know, at least from that standpoint, um, because there is such an overlap and we deal with this too. I also have dealt with mast cell issues and it, it can get super, super frustrating. Um, so Nick, I'd love to know, like, when were you actually formally diagnosed? Can you kind of take us through that? Like what kind of practitioner did you see? And when did you receive these various diagnoses? So in uh, 2021, I um, was over at a friend's house in uh, North Carolina, and uh, we we had a barbecue. Uh, we ate uh, ribs, potato salad, you know, the typical barbecue stuff, and um, uh, it was perfectly fine. And all of a sudden that night, I uh, went anaphylactic. Uh, I just thought I was, okay, I must have had food poisoning. I, I remember, why am I going to sleep? in the separate bedroom from my wife. I don't feel good. Um, and, um, uh, remember just going, you know, had severe diarrhea and, uh, and then it progressed from there and I started getting itchy head to toe. I mean, an itch that was unlike anything I've ever felt, uh, hives all over the place and throat closing up. And it was, uh, it, it was scary. So I knew, I had to get tested finally. I mean, my my family always kind of joked since I had that beef intolerance. Like, oh, oh you, you know, we'd see an article here and there. They send it to me. Oh, you need to get checked. You know, this and that. I'm like, I, I'm fine. I don't think it was that bad. You know, it was just with the GI upset stuff. Um, you know, I get a little gassy after eating uh, beef and, you know, bloating and all that stuff. It's not like I, I'm fine. I, it, it's okay. Uh, but then I went anaphylactic and I went and saw an allergist. Um, and they confirmed that uh, ran a blood test um, and they only really checked for um, alpha gal at the time. That was my main request. I basically demanded that I get tested for it. And um, I came back positive. And um, that, that's how I started, I guess, my self treatment, just, you know, with the diet. Um, and I, I still wasn't uh, quite getting uh, better. I, my GI symptoms and um, really all my stomach issues really went away, uh, but the rest of the uh, Lyme symptoms or I'd say more tick-borne disease symptoms just didn't really get too much better. So I went to, uh, do you want me to continue with the doctor stuff or do you want me to stop there as far as the alpha-gal diagnosis? Matt? <laughs> well, I have, I just have so many questions. So uh, yeah. Nick, if, I want to tie this back to what's going on in your life personally as well, because all this is, you know, it ties together. So the first question I have for you is you, despite all of your, your symptoms and getting worse in your twenties, you met your wife, you got married. And I believe by the time you were 22, you had your first child, correct? Or no, am I, am I mistaken with that? Uh, no, we, we had a, our first son in uh, 2017. So, okay. um, yeah, going back, I don't know how old I was at that point, 29, 28. Okay, so later 20s. Yeah. So also, what were you doing for work? I know that that plays a role into some of your willingness to want to get tested or not as well, right? 
Yes, absolutely. So for uh, the about the past 16 years, I uh, was working as an air traffic controller, um, which is uh, we, we had a very strict, very stringent uh, medical clearance. Um, I mean, so much so when I first got hired, um, basically controllers were getting fired for taking zero tech, um, which sounds absurd. Uh, but they basically that was a do not take drug. And if you've ever taken it before in your life, basically you weren't getting hired or you weren't. Uh, and people will lost their jobs or put on medical, uh, um, uh, basically unable to perform that job uh, just due to their medical clearance. So absolutely, I was not, um, uh, I, I was basically was hiding my symptoms as best as I could. And uh, when I would go see my primary care physician, say, hey, I just don't feel well. Um, you know, this doesn't feel right. Can you Test me for anything, but whatever you do, don't put it in writing because then I have to report it. Um, and that was uh, it's basically shooting myself in the foot looking back on it. Uh, but it's uh, you know it was a career decision at the time. Uh, so it's do I want to keep my job or not? And that's uh, basically a decision I made uh, at, at the time until it progressed uh, worse and worse uh, as, as I got older. Yes, I think if you can, if you don't mind, Nick, just going into now, you're going to the doctor, you get diagnosed, and definitely continue on that path if you don't mind, and uh, talking that through Candace. Yeah, so um, I got my alpha-gal diagnosis, and I started, uh, you know, I did an elimination diet um, at the time, and I I went complete, cut out every single mammal product that I could, uh, and my GI symptoms uh, really cleared up. Um, and that made a big improvement um even with my uh joint pain and uh that those issues as well it really helped uh, some of that inflammation come down uh but it was still my brain fog and fatigue issues just didn't really subside um so i scheduled an appointment with a integrative health uh, doctor and uh, finally made the decision to, okay, I, I need help. I need to get something done. Um, started having heart palpitations around that same time as well. And that was, was really scary for me and um, made an appointment with Dr. Commons, which was the leading uh, alpha gal syndrome researcher uh, since he was only about an hour away from me, which was a uh, very convenient. Uh, and also made an appointment for a, a Lyme a specialist for the integrative health, which I found on, I believe is the ILADS website or uh, Lyme disease advocacy uh, website. I found them, uh, um, this practitioner from there. And basically I had those appointments back to pack. Okay, like if Dr. Commons can't help me, then maybe, you know, this Lyme specialist can. And uh, yeah, I, I remember talking with Dr. Commons and, felt good to get validated on some of the issues but i remember one of my symptoms I, and i don't recall what it was but uh basically he kind of stopped writing his notes and kind of looked up at me i was like that's not normal is it that you normally hear he's like no no okay well i know there's more going on um and then i i believe it was the next day i think i had my appointment with the integrative health uh, specialist and um uh, and I thought, you know, having Dr. Commons and being validated and heard was good, but the Lyme specialist, the Lyme, uh, Lyme literate uh, doctor was on a different level. They were just so much more understanding than even, uh, you know, alpha gal specialist. It was, um, yeah, and I tried not to tear up a little bit because it was like, it, it was a weird feeling. Uh, but uh, that's when I started really going through the uh, Lyme disease um, treatment and testing. And uh, yeah, it, it really, really began uh, uh, the journey for the Lyme disease uh, treatment um, issues. Okay. Can you share with us like a little bit about what treatment that you actually went through? I know there's so many various treatments, but what did you find to be the most helpful for you? feel like I'm still so early in that journey because I've only uh, seen them for about a year, year and a half uh, at this point. Um, and I have to constantly remind myself, my wife constantly reminds me as well that, no, you're so much better than what you were. Uh, and 
I think it's just a slow, gradual process that it's hard for me to realize, um, you know, the improvements that I have made. Uh, but I it was initially uh, started on um, it's called Desbio protocol, which is a herbal, um, and I, I would finish that one and. It helped a little bit, maybe you know five, ten percent, which is um, good. Nick, can, um, can I interrupt you? I apologize for interrupting. Yeah. I, just to, I want to just focus on that piece because we've had several people in this podcast use Desbio in a variety of ways, and you know some have success, some didn't have success, some got worse. So I was wondering though, how long were you on it for, and if it did help, what symptoms specifically did it help you with? So there's basically you have three boxes of uh, tinctures or the first uh, first round, I believe it was three boxes of tinctures for three months, I think it was. It's hard for me to remember these. Um, and then you move into two different stages or three, di three different separate stages of Desbio bio protocol, if I'm remembering this correctly. The first boxes, you have to do that for three, three months or three boxes. And then you move into the second uh, box and then the third. Um, and what I noticed the improvement was more of my speech. I felt like I was like slurring my words and, um, it, it was just hard for me to talk. Uh, and that was, that was the biggest notice, uh, biggest improvement that I noticed, um, during that, uh, that process, uh, that, um, procedure, the Des bio protocol. So I also want to ask you, cause it's very interesting that you had, now a diagnosis of Lyme disease and alpha-gal, because many doctors say, I mean, I've had doctors say this to me, the deer tick generally is how you get Lyme disease here in the Northeast, and the Lone Star tick is how you get alpha-gal syndrome here in the Northeast. But if you're sick with alpha-gal, they're not thinking Lyme because it's a different tick that generally is known to spread Lyme compared to alpha-gal, right? And my question is, was this surprising to your doctors because either A, it meant that we're wrong and you got infected, you know, from with both from the same tick, or B, that you're just bit by so many ticks that you got bit by a deer tick or some other tick and got Lyme disease and maybe maybe a Lone Star tick and got, got alpha gal. But it could be more common than we think because here we are on a podcast with you who, you know, who now has alpha gal syndrome and Lyme disease. Right. Uh, my uh, my uh, doctor believes just because of how many tick bites that I've had, it's so hard to distinguish, you know, which is which. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I personally couldn't tell you, you know, yeah, I was bitten, you know, a thousand times by, uh, you know, a Lone Star tick. Um, I couldn't tell you, you know, being tick illiterate, I never saved ticks. I didn't care what type it was. I never even looked at what type it was. I just pulled them off and kept on going. Um, and that was, you know, to a disadvantage myself now, uh, not knowing what it was, what it could have carried and all that. Uh, now. So I also like to find out tips and tricks for people that are listening to this podcast, because you had, you, you had all these crazy allergy symptoms. You had the anaphylaxis, you got diagnosed with alpha gal with your local doctor, you pulled off, you know, you did a basically an elimination diet and you started to feel better, but not normal again. Right. You had some symptom relief, but you had all these other weird symptoms. You then see Dr. Commons, who sort of, he is the leader with AlphaGal, and a lot of things you said made sense, and some of the things you said sort of raised an eyebrow, like that doesn't seem consistent with AlphaGal syndrome. So I guess my question to you is, do you think that you know the, the experience of people who, who are going to get AlphaGal syndrome diagnoses and they're running into walls, they should consider a Lyme litter doctor as well because there's so much overlap, right? And I think sometimes you get into our little silos of I have Lyme disease, so it can't be alpha-gal, or I have alpha-gal, so maybe I don't have Lyme disease. But in many cases like yours, it's there's an overlap there. And and whether it's food, it's, you know, food sensitivities from Lyme or whether it's alpha-gal and a legit allergy against the alpha-gal protein, you know, we need to be more broad in our approach to getting help if we're not feeling better with whatever practitioner we're seeing, right? And that's that's the general thing I think I'm seeing here from from your story so far. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think the Lyme literate doctors, I think they look past even Lyme disease. Um, so I think they really understand that what's going on is more than just one thing. Um, and I think that that in itself helps so much just to be validated uh, and just to be heard on, on those, 
you know, all your symptoms and uh, all my symptoms and just, yeah, just to be heard and understood by a doctor that knows tick-borne disease uh, and not just, and understand that it's not just one thing that that's going on. Yeah. And I think it's, it's so huge. I mean, we talk about this on our podcast at two alpha gals, just the importance of our mental health, you know, and nurturing that. And I think when you get your team, the right team together, that's validating you, it can help you heal. You know, it starts kind of that process do, you know, I'm curious just, um, from a Lyme perspective, did you receive a clinical diagnosis with Lyme disease or did you test positive with, you know, the, the blood work that's done? Well, I tested negative for uh, Lyme disease um, for, I basically took every uh, Lyme disease test uh, and also a DNA test. Um, so I forget the, the names of them right now, Western blot. Uh, I know there's another blood blood test um, and I test negative on that. And then I did a DNA connections, um, a Lyme te test, and that was also a negative. Uh, I came back with one other um, uh, co uh, co-infection. Um, but yeah, just given I've had Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, tick-borne relapsing fever and um, alpha-gal, and uh, I was clinically diagnosed with uh, Lyme disease given my uh, symptoms and what was going on. I think that that is typically how it goes because it seems like those tests are just not super accurate. Um, so with your with your MCAS, how has all of that been since you've been starting on this protocol? Has that is it calmed down a little bit, or what has your experience been on that front? So um, with the MCAS, I didn't realize uh, you know what all was impacted. Uh, what you know, what was actually happening. Uh, so I started to realize I am fume reactive to alpha-gal. Uh, so for everyone that's not familiar, it's um, basically if someone's cooking food or cooking things with mammal products in it, uh, yeah, my throat would start to close up. Uh, basically, uh, have to be constantly clearing my throat, just trying to keep my airway open. Um, and that was happening a lot at work because the kitchen was right outside of the operations uh, uh, room and it was uh, getting difficult uh, at work um, with that going on. But with the um, protocols that, that I'm currently on, uh, which is the Cowden um, and just some herbal treatments, I mean, my MCAS seems to be very up and down now. Um, you know, it, it kind of goes back to what my baseline used to be, but then there's days where things don't affect me that much. Perfumes don't affect me as much anymore. So, you know, hopefully I'm you taking that roller coaster up where it's just up and down and hopefully things are getting better. Um, like I said, I'm still, I feel like I'm very early in my treatment and I'm just uh, trying to be positive and, you know, keep thinking, okay, well, at least I didn't have a reaction to that perfume or, you know, I can actually go outside or go through a store and not, you know, have to run away. Oh, I can so relate with you. <laughs> and it's so nice when you can get to that point and I hope it just continues to, to improve for you. So as you're talking about, like you were basically having anaphylactic reactions at work then, how long did you endure that? Uh, about two years, two, two and a half years of, of that. Um, yeah, I, I probably longer than that, but honestly, I, I realized what was happening, especially with the, the fume reactivity. I no one, no idea that it was happening, but it was just constantly clearing my throat, um, where I couldn't, you know, couldn't quite get, get it free. And I wasn't, nothing else in my environment was changing. And it was, uh, at times it was getting kind of difficult, but, uh, I had honestly, I didn't put two and two together and I never talked to a doctor about it either. So, um, you know, shooting myself in the foot. Well, and I think Luckily, there's nothing happened. Yeah. And I think there's a lot, you know, of, <sighs> of misinformation maybe out there about anaphylaxis, you know, of what that really looks like. I think it's just portrayed as, you know, in the movies and stuff, people are swollen, their eyes are swollen shut. They have hives, you know, it just doesn't always present that way. I, I was the same. It took me a long time to realize that 
do you have an EpiPen now and like a emergency plan? I'm still, you know, for being in that job for 16 years and I am still like very fearful of sounds bad, but I'm very fearful of using, uh, you know, an EpiPen because I know if I used it, I, I would have to report it and it would be a huge mess to try to get back uh, uh, my medical clearance. Um, I'm no longer in that position. Um, I've uh, stepped away from air traffic, um, but I'm still, it, it's a hard thing to get out of your head. Um, if you've been that way for, you know, your last 15, 16 years of uh, trying to hiding your, you know, what's going on. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I carry an EpiPen in my pocket all the time now um, and other drugs, uh, you know, Zyrtec if I'm traveling, um, but I have typically Allegra, Pepsid, and all those uh, emergency med medications uh, uh, that you take right at the beginning of a symptom. Because once again, you never know when it's going to happen or where, because we don't even know what's in the food that we eat. Yeah, no, and it's so smart. I mean, you just, you have to be prepared. I'm so glad that you were okay in those two years, because, you know, that's, it's really, really hard. Matt, do you want to, sorry. Do I do. I, 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 I'm i trying to be, uh, you know, I'm learning so much from you guys, but some of the, some of the questions I have for you, Nick, and I'm just fascinated by Alpha Gal and I'm, and I'm almost ashamed to admit, I don't know more, which is why I'm so happy to have Candace as a friend and now you, Nick, because I'm, I'm learning from you guys, which is you mentioned earlier that you're starting to get better and you're becoming less responsive to, you know, fumes and things in the air and, and certain foods. Do you think that the treatment you're doing for Lyme disease is having a positive impact on your alpha gal syndrome and making you less reactive? Uh, that's, that's speculation, absolutely. And I, um, you know, whether it's um, just the diet change, um, lifestyle change, uh, you know, air traffic control is one of the most stressful uh, jobs you can do. Um, it's, it used to be always in the top 10 most stressful positions and the sleep schedule is the worst thing known to man. I mean, I can't believe that it's one still going on. Um, even to this day with everything that's going on in the news with air traffic, but I mean, this, so but my sleep pattern has improved drastically, uh, since I've stepped away and, uh, you know, the lower stress. Yeah, I think everything combined with the the protocols, with the treatment from uh, my Lyme letter doctor, I think all of that combined is what is kind of pushing me towards improvement. Yeah, it's interesting because we all often hear that there's no cure for alpha gal and you have to live with it and there's nothing you can do. But I think what I'm hearing from you is, look, we don't have enough research. We don't have enough science and it's it's constantly evolving but there are things we can do to help ourselves, whether it be lifestyle, whether it be treatments, whether it be just strengthening our immune system or whatever, that it seemed to help you. So that that gives me hope that we're gonna be able to find better tools for people with alpha gal in the future. But another thing I want to ask you about, Nick, was you mentioned earlier, and I know you talked about it in your pre-interview questionnaire, that you believe and your doctors believe that maybe you weren't testing positive for Lyme despite having Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and I think it was a, a tick-borne relapsing fever and alpha gal syndrome, because you were such you were very active and very athletic and that because you were such an active person that maybe that caused a, a problem with the testing. So can you speak to that a little bit? Cause that, that stuck out for me for people that are struggling with the diagnosis as well. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the, um, one of the other issues was uh, that maybe I didn't um, exercise enough prior to doing the DNA test, which uh, I know that's uh, uh, that can be an issue. And part of the reason why that so even the DNA tests aren't always uh, accurate. Um, but I, I've, uh, a doctor had mentioned that, uh, before and, um, uh, and I've heard you guys speak about that as well as far, as far as more active people, just, they don't test positive. Um, so they basically, I don't really know a whole lot about it, but, uh, that's just what I was, uh, you know, told and learned from you guys as well. I yeah. uh, told by my doctor and uh, learned from you guys. Yeah, we, we hear it often. And it's just a common theme that we've been hearing from other doctors and other patients. And I just wonder if it means, you know, you're you're doing all you can to be healthy and your body's fighting it off. And the Lyme bacteria itself is in such low concentrations in our blood, that the more you're fighting it by exercise and lifestyle changes and good diet, there's even less of it to be responsive to during a blood test, right? So I'm anecdotally making that observation could be false, could be true, right? But it's something it's a pattern we've seen. So the, the other part is, 
that I really want to talk to you about is you've done some other things you treat. In addition to Desbio, you also did low dose naltrexone as well. So can you speak to your experience with that? Yeah, so that to me was the um, single biggest improvement that I have felt uh, was starting the low dose naltrexone or Narcan. Um, and basically, I, I mean, once again, most of these treatments uh, don't really notice the improvement until later um because i think it's just small small improvements uh but when um i remember i was on ldn uh, low dose naltrexone for about uh you know, 90 days and i didn't renew my prescription in time so i was off of it for like a week and it's like the inflammation just came back with a vengeance and it's just wow okay this stuff is actually working and that was the you know, the, the single biggest thing that I realized that how much it was helping, um, but it was the inflammation part of it. My joints felt it, they weren't in constant pain all the time anymore. Um, I mean, they were in, I guess I should say they weren't in severe pain uh, anymore. You know, I didn't have wake up and I couldn't walk for, you know, 15, 20 minutes until my joints kind of loosened up and things like that. So that was, to me, that, that was the single best um, treatment that I've been on so far. Nick, were you with the same doctor all along? So you went to this doctor, you went to ILADS, International Lyme and Associated Disease Society. You found their directory probably sounds like to find a Lyme litter doctor. And you found your first doctor who did this bio. Was that the doctor that prescribed you low-dose naltrexone? And did you see any other Lyme doctors throughout the last year plus of treating? No, I was, I've been with the same, uh, same doctor, the same practitioner, this, uh, um, for the last about a year and a half, maybe two years, um, and been on that treatment plan uh, with them. So um, they've suggested a lot of the other treatments that I hear on your show. Uh, I just haven't, um, uh, I guess, don't really have the time or I don't mentally, uh, I'm not prepared to do them. Uh, so I, I struggle to believe like how much it'll help. And if I'm in that state of mind, I don't, I don't feel like I'm ready to try it. Uh, the ozone therapy and things like that. Uh, I'm just not ready to try those yet mentally. Um, so, um, but yeah, that, I've been with them the whole time. So what, what other things have you done? Because I know from just chatting a little bit offline and again, your questionnaire, Japanese knotweed is a very common herb people use. And it looks like you used it. And I, I guess the product you use, I'm going to Baba BB7. Is that what it's called? A boba BB7. Uh, it was a um, Japanese knotwood treatment. Um, that was the first thing that I started on um, before the Desbio. Uh, and I, I actually had a really bad Herx, Herxheimer reaction uh, from that. And uh, then I started into the uh, Desbio. Um, and outside of that, uh, we went down uh, hormone therapy, uh, basically testosterone injections, um, which helped, uh, I guess, slightly. Honestly, I didn't feel a whole lot. I was expecting that to be like the golden ticket to uh, change my fatigue around, and it, it didn't. I mean, it's it's helped. It's improved, but um, that, that wasn't the golden ticket. Uh, I don't think there is any such thing in, in Lyme disease or alpha-gal or any tick-borne disease. Um, yeah, and so the Japanese knotwood, Des Bio, and basically just uh, – vitamins, uh, supplements, uh, vitamin D, vitamin C. Um, and I believe that was, uh, that was pretty much my whole hit from the start, uh, was those, uh, four things, five things. So you talked about the herxing, right. From the Japanese knotweed, which makes sense because it's a pretty strong antimicrobial. But one of the things that we often hear when people have mast cell activation syndrome and they have this histamine intolerance, they often have to start with a lower dose of treatment because they herx way more than people who don't have MCAS. So do you think that's something you experienced? Because it sounds like you had it pretty early on, and then you went on to the Desbio. So is that a consideration? And do you think that it was a harder balance for you with the herx reaction and the detox reaction because of your MCAS and also the alpha-gal, right? The alpha-gal itself is making you more you know, inflamed. Yeah, I think uh, that all, you know, it all plays into a, uh, a role into healing and treatments. Um, yeah, later on, um, after the Dead's Bio, we tried um, methylene blue, which um, is supposed to be great for the brain fog um, uh, issues that, you know, us Lyme people um, 
I hope no one takes offense to calling us line people, but um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's supposed to really help with the uh, brain fog. And I I wonder if it's MCAS or Alpha Gal, uh, but I could not tolerate it at all. Um, basically, in an hour hour and a half after taking um, my dosage, I would just be incredibly inflamed and uh, felt sick to my stomach, and um, which led me to calling the manufacturer. Okay, well, what's going in this? It's like, oh, it's just water and, you know, this dye. Okay, well, what's your filtering process? Um, and basically, I just couldn't get a clear answer from anyone, even the uh, the people to manufacture it. So I'm not really sure what caused that, whether it's MCAS or AlphaGal or anything like that. But it's definitely uh, uh, you know, a hard thing to know what is, when, once again, what's causing my reaction. And that's always the question. And very rarely do we get a clear answer. So Nick, as you were talking, I was immediately wondering, and then you brought up manufacturing and the questions that we kind of have to do, you know, this deep dive as, as alpha gal patients, did you, did you research or ha did your practitioner research the treatments prior to seeing if they were alpha gal safe? I mean, especially for those that are, you know, alpha gal out there listening do you know if they have any mammal containing products? Yeah. Um, so this practitioner uh, really blew my mind. Um, they, you know, put me on all these, uh, the supplements and uh, some of the drugs. They're like, oh, well, we called the, our pharmacy uh, downstairs, our dispensary downstairs, and there's no mammal in it. I'm like, you called? It, what? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it um, really surprised me now i with like the methylene blue situation that they uh, gave me uh, i still call the manufacturers that i don't think they go to those extremes because okay well look at the ingredients okay there's no mammal in this but okay how far do you go and since there's no labeling with the fda there's no requirements to have anything and you know oh, this uh this product contained might may contain trace mammal ingredients um, uh, FDA, if you're listening, that'd be great. Um, but they don't. Uh, so once again, they, they only go so far without calling the manufacturing and talking to the people putting it together. Um, uh, we just don't know. Um, but it really blew my mind that, that my practitioner called the pharmacy and at least took that initial step. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I mean, I feel like most of them, don't do that or they leave it up to you to, you know, talk to your pharmacist or, or what have you. So I love that. I'm going to have to get the name of this practitioner after we, <laughs> after we finish. So what, what does this mean when you, so Nick, you said earlier, you call the manufacturer and then you're like, Hey, wait a second, what's your filtration process? What does that even mean? Right. I mean, if, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm picking up that phone and I work for this company and you're saying, what's your filtration process? You know, I'm just curious, like at at how deep does it go with your allergies with alpha gal? Because not only how you manufactured, but it's like your filtration process. Is there any kind of byproduct? It seems like this is really, really sensitive. So I just want to hear more about that. So kind of backtracking right around my anaphylaxis event, I was drinking a beer. Uh, and after that beer, um, basically I started breaking out at hives. I'm like, I didn't have lunch. Like what's going on? Like, you know, I, all I had was a beer, um, you know, looking back after, and then my, I got my alpha gal diagnosis diagnosis, and I started doing a deep dive, um, into alpha gal and everything that's about and came across alpha gal information.org, which is, I think the single most, you know, the single best resource that anyone could ever have with alpha gal. Um, I'm going to do a shout out to, I believe her name was Sharon. Yep. She put it together. Uh, and it's an absolutely fantastic website because it's not only for people that are suffering from alpha gal, but there's enough quotations, citations in there that you could give that uh, website to your doctor and they could learn things from it because she took the time to do all the citations and do all of that work to make it that way. Uh, but beer, wine, they use filtering uh, clarifying uh, agents gelatin and uh, i can't think of the name right now but there's also a dairy um, uh, finishing agent 
that a lot of beer and wine manufacturers use in their products. And it can send us into a, a reaction. Um, water, um, some RO filters, some kitchen filters, bottled water, they use bone charcoal in the filters. And there's no way that, you know, if you look at the label, they're not going to label that. So it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to, once again, navigate. So that manufacturer, I call it, say, okay, you got, you know, uh, water in your product. How are you filtering that water? Oh, we're using this. All right. Well, what is the filtering agent? Uh, it's, you know, X, Y, and Z. Okay. What's your next stage filter? Oh, it's X, Y, and Z. Okay. Do you have another stage? And you have to ask all these questions because, oh, our filter is this. Okay. That's just the first filter. What about the, the next three? Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's a hard process to figure out. Yeah. I mean, these are things that I frankly have never thought about. Right. And I think most of us haven't until you have to like the case you're in. Right. So, I mean, you, you mentioned a bone charcoal filter, right? So when it comes to that, does that mean that that filter itself is contaminating the water and therefore it's going to trigger a reaction when you when you consume whatever that is that was filtered with that water that you're now consuming? Yes, absolutely. So the bone charcoal is, you know, ground up male uh, or I guess roasted mammal bones that are ground up and then put into a, a filter cartridge. So it could be the filter cartridge on your fridge and you have to call the manufacturer to when you go to replace the fridge uh, filter to make sure it doesn't have bone jar in it. Yeah, I do want to give a shout out to alphagalinformation.org, I think. Is that what it is, guys? Am I saying it right? Okay. Because, Candace, you put that on to us about a year or two ago when we first met, and we recommend that website to everybody. It's really a good website about the testing. It has the most comprehensive information out there as far as alphagal is concerned. So we're going to link to that in the show notes of this podcast as well. But the other thing I want to ask your opinion on, Nick, is, I mean, we see articles all the time about now genetically modified food products where they're taking the alpha gal protein out of it to make ags safe meat for people to eat that have alpha gal syndrome i mean what are your personal thoughts on that well i, I did try this um so i got a meat delivery pork delivery from a company called revivicor uh, they are genetically modifying pigs for organ transplants and and uh, humans um, and they'll send, they'll process and send out um, for free uh, to alpha gal patients uh, pork products. Um, now I got my delivery and um, dove right in. I was super pumped about it. I mean, I was so excited. I was like, I've never really seen you excited, or, you know, lately. I was like, yeah, I'm just like you know, bacon. You know, <laughs> how do you not get excited? Um, and then I tried it and I was actually underwhelmed. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a weird sensation. I was, I was off of, you know, all mammal products for like a year, year and a half at that point. And I, after eating it, I was like, I, I don't really miss this. Um, and then I had, I think it was the MCAS reaction to some of the uh, cured products. Uh, so some of the, the ham sausage and um, bacon, I, I would get kind of itchy from that. And I think it was just an MCAS uh, reaction. Um, I actually spoke to the Reviv Revivicor uh, company. Um, they called me after having that, uh, after saying I had that reaction and spoke to them for like two hours. And they were very receptive of it and trying to work on uh, fixing whatever it is. I was blown away at that, that a company was taking that much care uh, in their product. Um, but yeah, once again, I, I was so underwhelmed by eating pork again that i don't miss it um mm -hmm. i mean I, I appreciate what they're doing and to for those people that do miss it i think it's a huge benefit to them um but yeah i was uh, i was not one of those so i just want to circle back to the hormone therapy you said you did some testosterone injections and the intent was to help with the fatigue did that it's it sounds like it had some minimal impact but not much so can you speak to what brought you to doing those you know hormone replacement therapies that you did and looking back is it something that you think is helpful for people in the Lyme community i think so um so i, I you know i'll tell almost uh too much information but uh at the start of my illness on the onset in 2010 i mean the fatigue and uh sex drive just 
plummeted and to be in my mid to low thirties for that to happen is, I mean, it shouldn't have. Um, but those things, you know, a little bit of the fatigue and the sex drive has improved greatly with the testosterone. Um, and you know, it's just with the fatigue to day to day life. I mean, I think the testosterone has helped. I mean, my, my doctor, the Lyme literate doctor, um, says, you know, typically if your hormones aren't in balance, basically your immune system isn't, uh, basically can't respond in the way it should. So if we get the hormones to where they should be, then your immune system should help fight whatever it is that's going on and should help uh, you improve a, as we move forward. So I think it was a great, um, you know, one of the early steps. And um, yeah, I, I think uh, as long as it helps me a little bit, then uh, I'm willing to keep on going. You mentioned earlier that you started the Cowden Protocol. So what made you and your doctor pivot away from Desbio and LDN and Japanese knotweed and go to the Cowden Protocol? And did you have more success with the Cowden Pro Protocol than you think you did with Desbio? Um, so it's a little too early to tell. I think I've been on the Cowden for uh, three weeks. So it's it's super early. Um, but yeah, it was basically, I, I feel like with the Desbio, uh, I went through the whole protocol and I didn't feel a whole lot of improvement. So um, basically it was the uh, our, my doctor's uh, decision to try something different. You know, okay, well, that might've worked a little bit. Let's pivot and try something else. Um, and I am fortunate uh, that he is very anti, you know, here's some uh, antibiotics and go. Um, and because I, I hear all the horror stories and I was on antibiotics most of my childhood. So I, I kind of fear for, all, you know, going back down that road um, with my stomach issues. I mean, who knows how much that played in a, a factor with all this. So. I'll try keep trying all these different herbals and see if we can make it, uh, some more improvements uh, as I continue with those. Yeah, I do wonder the antibiotics you were on pretty chronically as a child, did they impact your gut microbiome, which made you more susceptible to chronic tick-borne illness rather than more mild tick-borne illness you had as, as a kid, right? That's something that I can't help but think about. And the follow-up question I want to ask you is, we know from your, again, your questionnaire that you filled out for this podcast that you talked about airless download syndrome as well, and that being a problem in your journey. So if you could just speak to that, because that's a very common implication in the Lyme community, and I don't think it's spoken about enough. Yeah, so one of the, the one of my symptoms that just was unexplainable by Lyme or any tick-borne disease was my loose joints. Um, so as I got older and... Uh, with the kids don't exercise quite as often i uh, started having a lot of joint issues uh sublax laxations i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right basically it's a mild um a dislocation um and yeah anytime i would like take a knee uh to you just resting your weight on your knee my knee joint would slip and grind it would actually pop and it was really bad uh, but m most of my large joints will do some form of that. And it's super painful. Uh, had a couple, um, had one knee surgery. I have two tears in both my knees, uh, and the cartilage again. And, um, yeah, so went through the diagnostic, uh, testing for that with my Lyme literate doctor and, uh, you know, searching for answers. And, um, basically there's a score scoring sheet on, I think it's the Biden score. Um, and scored high enough on that to get a diagnosis for Ehrler Danlos as well. And um, spoke to one of the doctors there, so, so I needed to talk to a, uh, a, a different doctor to get the diagnosis. And basically, it's like th there seems to be a very high link between Lyme disease and the Ehrler Danlos. And he hypothesized about you know having those loose joints or and having a uh, basically an easier time for the Lyme uh, bacteria to thrive in the joints. Um, I don't think there's any evidence on that, but I think it's, uh, you know, it makes sense in my mind at least. So um, yeah, it, it definitely uh, once again was, I guess, reassuring and uh, I can't think of the word, but 
yeah. validating. Uh, I, I agree. We, we've had so many people on this podcast tell us that they're hypermobile or they say I have airless download syndrome or I have, you know, heads, right? You call it whatever you want to call it. But in the end, I say, you know, are you bendy? Are you bendable? Right. That's, that's a very simple way to ask you the question. Were you, were you like bendable your whole life? And, you know, do you think you, are you hypermobile? What does that mean? And most people in the chronic Lyme community answer yes, not all, but many do. And I think there's definitely a correlation there. We've had doctors, we've had patients hypothesize, we've had other people come on and get very defensive and say, it's a genetic disorder. It's not related to Lyme disease, Matt. And, you know, I, I think it's important to note that so many of these things are separate in a way, but together collectively, they cause more serious illness. Just like we said, alpha-gal is a separate syndrome, which I don't like the word syndrome because it implies it's mental health and it implies that it's not a real thing. But to me, alpha-gal syndrome is real. It's an allergy to a protein that we get from a tick bite. And that allergy is brought on later on in life because of a tick bite. And now we can no longer eat these foods and we become uber sensitive. And it's not just, I can't eat steak, right? That's the other thing I want to highlight. Alpha gal syndrome is I can't, it's not just I can't eat a juicy hamburger or a juicy steak. It's so much worse. And I think you described that really well, Nick, as far as the human sensitivities, the ability to not be able to take certain medicines, the bone charcoal filters. I mean, these things are wild things that you have to worry about that people never associate with alpha gal syndrome from a tick bite. But beyond all that, I just think that we need to highlight these things can live separately, meaning somebody can have just you know, airless animal syndrome. But when you have airless animal syndrome, which is a genetic disorder in, in some cases, depending on the type and the subtype, collectively with Lyme, it makes us way more sick, which is why the chronic community has that in common, in my opinion, right? So that, that's an important note to not, not trigger certain people that are listening to this podcast into thinking that we're diminishing these other conditions like, like airless animal syndrome is just being a minor piece of Lyme. It, it is independent. But I, I want to highlight one of the other things that I, I learned from you again, or reinforce, I should say, which is later on in life, you said you were getting bit by ticks so much that you invested in a chicken and the backyard chickens, I should say ch chickens, plural, the backyard chickens significantly reduced the amount of ticks in your yard and you were bit less because of it. Yeah. Um, so the, our last house in uh, Tallahassee um, was, yeah, it was, seemed like it was, just infested with chicks in the backyard. Um, manicured yard, not a whole lot of bushes. We put up a fence to keep the deers out. Um, and we had a couple of fruit trees, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. It didn't seem like a tick haven. You know, I, I think of a tick haven would be in the woods, you know, a lot of brush, a lot of dead leaves on the ground, things like that. But that was a well manicured yard and I'd go from the backyard to where the kids would play on the trampoline. And, I'd pick up three ticks basically every time I'd walk out there and it was unreal. Um, so we had the yard professionally treated, didn't make a difference. I think we had them out two or three different times, treated it ourselves, trying some, you know, oils, essential oils and things like that. Didn't make much of a difference. And some of my coworkers were talking um, about their chickens and that they ate anything that moved. And so I went down the Google rabbit hole and I was like, do, tick, do chickens, you know, eat ticks? Sure enough, they do. I was like, that's it. I'm buying chickens. <laughs> so our, our HOA at the time, it was in our bylaws that we couldn't have them. I'm like, well, we'll just see how long we can get away with it. So we put some chickens in the backyard and I, we started out, we bought a dozen uh, chicks um, and we ended up giving away a lot of them. We kept three in a, a small little chicken coop that we could kind of hide in our backyard and the, behind the fence where the neighbors wouldn't see. And uh, yeah, they, they did a great job of absolutely eating every tick out there. I mean, I don't think we got a single tick when we had the chickens and we just let them free roam in the backyard, our fenced in backyards, clipped their wings so they couldn't jump the fence. And it was, uh, we actually got some relief from that. And I was like blown away that one, you know, how many little insects that they would eat and two uh, free eggs. So how can you beat that? Vegetarian fed too, which sometimes we got to worry about that. So I, I do want to ask, because I know now that we have kind of gone through your, most of your journey, you're 37 today, you have two children, you're married. Now, what are your thoughts as far as the possibility of 
passing along some of these conditions to your children? Because this is a really serious topic that many people have strong opinions about. And I'm curious if you discuss this with your doctor at all, or if you've thought about it, you know, were you actively infected around the time, you know, your children were born? And if that's something that you thought about or, or had them tested or done anything like that? That crosses my mind a lot, uh, especially with my oldest, um, because like myself, she is a tick magnet. Um, my youngest and my wife are, they don't really affect them that much. Uh, they could be in the same area and my oldest picked up three ticks and I will pick up, you know, the same amount of ticks as my oldest. Um, but I, I do worry about that all the time. And, um, I, I, we really need to get him a hygienics testing, uh, and make sure, uh, that he doesn't suffer from any of this, but, uh, like he stated it, I don't know if there's any studies that I know, um, maternally there could be, um, there, there, there is a, a possibility to transfer that but paternally I, I haven't seen anything that really you know might uh, suggest that and um but i i still worry about that a lot because of you know some of his symptoms uh some things that i see going on with him um yeah i definitely worry about that yeah and i think it's a really hard conversation because to your point is it possible that that was a child birth you know, passed from, you know, passed on during birth? Or is it something that you're just living in a tick endemic community and he's been bitten and and possibly infected, right? And I think that's where the testing comes into play and, and possibly a clinical diagnosis like you had in your case of Lyme and possibly using some natural tools as you're using to help combat Lyme because some of these natural tools are really good for your general health regardless and can also be used to address the Lyme disease. So I think it's, it's something it's healthy to think about, but also something that we can stress out and become obsessed with either, right? And I think I think your approach, Nick, is a really healthy approach to being concerned, but also not letting it, you know, ruin your life or impact the life of your child and, and his ability to live a happy, healthy life and be able to do things and and not live in a bubble as well. So I think that's that's there's balance like with everything there. So if I had to ask you, looking back on your journey, if you had to provide our listeners with one or several low cost or no cost solutions to address Lyme and or alpha gal syndrome, what would they be? Um, probably diet, hydration, and sleep. Those are, those are the three big things that uh, help me out. And, you know, they don't cost hardly anything. Uh, alpha gal diet's expensive. Uh, absolutely. Um, but if uh, you can, if you don't have alpha gal Lyme disease, changing your diet up, um, hydration, I, I think that made a huge in, improvement. Um, before my diagnosis, I was drinking just a ton of water because it's the only thing that made me feel better. Um, and uh, the sleep aspect of it, uh, you know, get as much sleep as you can, um, let your body re repair and recover. What is an alpha gal diet, right? Because now you, you mentioned the word alpha gal diet. You said it's pretty expensive, but it's worth it. What does that look like for you? Uh, very repetitive. Um, I, I think that's uh, the best way to put it. Um, because you, you kind of pick your brands, you know it's safe, and I you always reach for those same brands uh, out there. Um, but yeah, it's uh, basically a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruits. Um, rice is a very safe thing. Um, and yeah, it's, I try not to experiment unless I'm going to be around the house. Um, but it's a lot of, uh, you know, experimentation with different brands and different products uh, and to see if it works for you, uh, whether it's MCAS, AGS, you know, nothing, you know, not one person is going to be the same. So what works for Candace might not work for me. Um, and the sensitivity of alpha gal on top of that, um, everyone's, uh, some people can tolerate dairy, uh, and a lot of us can't. So there is no one specific alpha gal diet other than no, you know, red meat, uh, no, you know, beef, pork, goat, sheep outside of that. It, it's, it varies a lot based upon their sensitivity, um, and, uh, their, I guess, MCAS and everything else that's going on with them. 
Um, but yeah, really just no beef, pork, beef, camel, you name it. We can't have it. But uh, a lot of fish, fish, chicken, and turkey. Emu is one of the uh, great things that I found is a uh, pork, I'm uh, sorry, a beef substitute. Tastes just like beef. And uh, fortunately, I live like 45 minutes from one of the largest emu farms in the nation um, down in uh, uh, just south of us in Greensboro. So Nick, what's on the horizon for you? You mentioned you're a couple of weeks into the Cowden Protocol. What are you planning for the future? And give us an assessment as to where your health is at now, because not only from a food sensitivity standpoint and a reaction of a alpha gal syndrome standpoint, but also your chronic Lyme health, right? Because you were pretty pretty banged up from Lyme disease as well. Yeah, it, it's just yeah, I kind of mentioned it before. It's like that roller coaster, um, the roller coaster of healing or improvement, and uh, it's it just hopefully staying on that gradual path uh, of improving. Um, I mean, there's for years. I every time I got out of bed, it hurt to walk so bad. I just would be limping around the house for the first thirty minutes as my joints loosened up, so I could, you know, get around. Um, but that has kind of subsided, and as long as I keep making gradual, small improvements, that's that's all I can hope for. Um, yeah, de-stressing my life. That's a big thing, um, and just trying to make small gradual improvements every day yeah that's huge and i want to encourage you as one of the last things i say here i want to encourage you to partner with two alpha gals and candace because there aren't enough alpha gal syndrome awareness groups or people out there and what candace and debbie are doing with two alpha gals is huge you know partner with some of the leaders in the space you mentioned dr commons and some others and i know candace knows them personally she's met them she's advocated, gone to research, you know, seminars with them. And I think you would be a huge addition to this community, Nick, to help advocate because we need more people doing this. We don't have enough in the Lyme community, but we have far more in the Lyme community than we do the alpha gal community. So I'm willing to give you up to the alpha gal community is where I'm teasing. I'm being <laughs> silly, right? It's us against them. It's never that. We're all one big family, as you can tell, because we love Candace and, and, uh, and you know, the entire two alpha gals fam uh, you know, community. But we do need more people to help advocate and bring attention to alpha gal syndrome because I just had somebody here on Long Island where alpha gal is huge come into work and share with me, knowing you know about tick boot camp, knowing about my experience, telling me that he got diagnosed with alpha gal after quite a long time of having crazy food you know allergic reactions and not knowing anything about it. And you know it's it's here on Long Island where it's really really prominent. So we need more voices. You know, Nick, you have a you have a really good story to share with people to help them and to raise awareness. So I want to encourage you guys to continue on in this advocacy together and continue to build a community because, you know, Dr. Rolls, when we first started, told us when Rich and I first interviewed him, I think it was episode eight of our podcast, that the grassroots efforts are what is going to make change in this world. And we see, we've seen it happen over the last five years. These grassroots efforts and these communities coming together and working together is how we've been able to make some of the change we've we've made in this community. So please continue on, Nick, with your av advocacy. And I want to thank you for joining our Tickwood Camp podcast. Candice, I want to thank you for coming and co-hosting because this was a really powerful discussion about Alpha Gal and Lyme together. And I don't think we've ever had such a deep conversation about the two in, in one patient before. So thank you both. And we look forward to seeing all you're going to do together. Thank you for having me. This was great.